Good afternoon. Good morning. Hello, everyone. It is a pleasure to have this webinar today, and I think it's very timely. In 2018, WHO published its first ever report on suicide prevention, preventing suicide a global imperative. Our director general made a call for action in this report. We know what works, and there are evidence-based interventions available. The to act is now. Before 2013, the WHO member states adopted the Mental Health Action Plan 2013 to 2020 at the Health Assembly. We committed to the target 3.2 to reduce suicide rates in countries by 10% by the year 2020. Report: The UN adopted in 2015 the Sustainable Development Goals by the year 2030. Goal is to ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for at all ages. Target four is by the year 2030 to reduce by one third premature mortality from communicable diseases through prevention and treatment and mental health and well being. The first indicator, 342, is the suicide mortality rate. Only a few weeks back, WHO published its health statistics for the year 2016, titled Monitoring Health for the SDGs, and it summarizes available data indicators. In this context of the action plan of the Sustainable Development Goals by the year 2030, today comes very timely. Pointed out that governments need to assume the role of leadership as they bring together a multitude of stakeholders to work together. No matter where a country stands currently, based on their resources and contexts, there are actionable steps that can be taken. A comprehensive multi sectoral national suicide prevention strategy, for instance, raises suicide as a major public health problem and it's the commitment of a government to tackling the issue. To have speakers with us who will tell us more about the policy making on suicide prevention in their countries. First is Professor Ella Arensman from Ireland. And second is Dr. Yeshi Wang Di from Taiwan. To introduce each speaker before they speak. So, it's time for Professor Arensman now. Professor Arensman is Director of Research with the National Suicide Research Foundation and adjunct professor with the Department of Epidemiology and Public Health, University College Cork in Ireland. He has a Master's of Science and PhD from Leiden University in the Netherlands. President of the National Association for Suicide Prevention. Mm -hmm. <coughs> President of the European Alliance Against Depression. She has been involved in research and prevention into suicide and self harm for 30 years, with emphasis on risk and protective factors associated with suicide, self harm, and effectiveness of and self harm intervention programs. In the end, she played a key role in developing the first and the second national suicide prevention program. The first reach out from 2005 to 14, and the second connecting for life 2015 to 2020. In collaboration with the World Health Organization and as ISP president, has been proactive in the development of national suicide prevention programs and strategies in countries. So I would like I have to give the floor now to Professor Ellen Arensman for her presentation, please. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's fine. And I also would like to ask, are the slides visible? Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. That's just to check that, yeah. So, 
And, and first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Alexander Scheichmann and the UHO for inviting me to present on the new National Suicide Prevention Strategy for Ireland, uh, which I think is a particular example of an evidence-informed suicide prevention strategy. Ireland is a country with just over 4 million people where we have seen over the years a growing support of the government to support suicide prevention initiatives, and this is particularly since 2005. What I'd like to do today is give you a little bit of background as to how we arrived at the second suicide prevention strategy, which was launched last year, also how it worked in terms of uh, policy priorities, but also taking into account the evidence base uh, to build this second suicide prevention strategy. Uh, there is no space to go through all the strategic goals and actions, but I give you a number of particular evidence-informed actions that we are pursuing now for implementation under this new strategy. And I will also end with um, addressing some specific points in relation to implementation, monitoring, and evaluation of a long-term and complex suicide prevention strategy. So we are in Ireland in suicide rates, but also in terms of rates of undetermined uh, death. Uh, as Dr. Fleischmann already indicated, uh, Ireland had its first national suicide prevention strategy in 2005. This was a 10-year uh, strategy, which came to an end in 2014. And as you can see, during this period of time, we had two peaks of uh, suicide. And the first peak of increased suicide rates was during the economic recession. And we have clearly seen uh, an association between an increase in adversity and also uh, austerity in Ireland and increasing rates of suicide, particularly um, during the recession. Um, Alexandra, I see comments coming in that there is an echo on the line. Uh, can we do something about that? There seems to be an echo. Well, I, I continue uh, anyway. So, um, yes, we've seen this significant increase, which was about 15%, uh, but with the economic recession. And during the same time, we also saw an increase in the rates of undeterred deaths. And it would be my advice, particularly for countries where there is a coronial uh, recording procedure for suicide, to not only look at suicide rates, but also rates of undeterred deaths. We are very fortunate to have a, uh, a national surveillance system for self-harm. So we operate since 2002 uh, a national registry for hospital presentations of self-harm. And interestingly, in the same period when we saw an increase in suicide rates, we also saw a very strong increase in fatal self-harm, and particularly among men in Ireland. And this increase during 2007 and 2010 was... Excuse a me, excuse me, a short break with regard yeah. to the echo. Yeah. Uh, it looks like... You uh, have linked online twice because in the right hand menu your yes. name appears twice. Would it be please possible to click the second time your name is there in the menu on the right hand menu yes. to click on the second one and say end yes. and or exit the session and then you would be there only once and then maybe this resolves the echo, echo okay. issue, please. Okay, okay. Thank you. Yeah. On the right side? Yes, and your name appears twice. Um, um, uh, Alexandra. Oh, you need a list of names? I see a list of names, but I don't know how. I can delete because I don't see the uh, uh, you uh, okay. 
Yes. And it, you cannot uh, say disconnect or exit. Okay. It's a bit sad. Then, uh, sorry, yes. Then please proceed. Is, is it better? The echo is still there a bit. I mean, you can be clearly heard. Yeah. It's just um, an echo in the background. I've been able to mute one of them. Mm -hmm. Now it's still there. Um, um, well, please, please, please proceed, and I'll try to find out how to yeah. exit one of the names. Yeah. yeah. Is this better? No, it doesn't change. Eh? No, the echo is still there. Yes. So I can okay. see you and I'm working. Yes, please. Uh, okay. Echo. Yeah. Yes. So, yes. Yeah, ah, now, now it's there. The host has removed the second Ella Arensman <laughs> from yes, the meeting. Well. So now you are here only once and I think the echo is gone. Please proceed. Very, Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, so parallel with the suicide uh, rate increases, we also saw these very strong uh, increases in male self-harm, and this was up to 30% only in a period of three years, which is um, very, very uh, significant. You can see in recent years, we have um, a slight downward trend, but currently we're still up to the level of 6% higher compared to the 2007 uh, rates. To see what has happened in Ireland in, uh, in, in, in recent times, and particularly in terms of the whole development of suicide prevention. Uh, you may not be aware that uh, Ireland was the last country in Western Europe where suicide was criminalized, and that is uh, still very uh, clearly prominent and tangible, particularly when we go to rural areas. The stigma around suicide and mental health is, is still uh, very strong, and that's also one of the aspects that's going to be addressed in the new suicide prevention strategy. Uh, Five, there was the first national task force on uh, suicide, uh, which produced a report that led to the establishment of a national suicide uh, review group. And the review group was the way for the first national uh, strategy for action on suicide prevention, so the 10 year strategy that started in. 2005. And review of the REACH strategy, um, the operations started, um, this is now more than three years ago, for the new Connecting strategy that was launched in June last year. So, in terms of the uh, preparations, uh, the entire period of prep preparing this new five year strategy took about 18 months, and in this slide you can clearly see the important steps that were taken over this uh, period of time. Um, so um, um, an, a national oversight and planning group was uh, established, and on this planning group uh, there are uh, many representatives from uh, stakeholders uh, from different disciplines, but also what was a step in the right direction, there were already a number of um, representatives from different, different government departments, so not only the Department of Health. So this group, of which I was a member, had a kind of an overseeing, uh, reviewing uh, view over the 18 months to preparing the new strategy. This was linked in with five specific expert advisory groups, and um, these specific groups were covering uh, such as policy, research, practice, and government, but also communication, uh, which also covered the update of uh, media guidelines and reporting of suicide. Another important step was to strengthen the research and evidence base for the new strategy, and um, in different topic as evidence briefs were prepared, but we also were very fortunate to link in with recommendations coming from the new global report published by WHO in 2014. At level of public engagement, uh, there was a major national consultation with the general public in terms of uh, specific uh, proposals, needs, or suggestions in terms of suicide prevention, and you can see here that nearly 300 uh, submissions were uh, made. And unique uh, aspect
aspects of development of this new strategy was the government department engagement, which was uh, pr processed and produced in a very proactive way. So, as with some other strategies, again, the Department of Health had a leading role, was leading the process, but the difference was that this round at the table, we had many representatives from government departments as well, such as the Department of Education, the Department of Justice, and also uh, social welfare and other uh, government departments. And I think that certainly has made a difference to uh, how the strategy looks, but also how the implementation process will evolve over time. At the research and evidence, um, we have a range of uh, briefings and reviews, which were taken in consideration very rigorously and seriously. Um, and in addition to some of the resources that I mentioned, also our National Health Research Board uh, conducted a review of evidence based interventions and suicide prevention programs at the same time. So, all of this evidence was taken into account to, uh, first of all, determine uh, key priority groups in the population who were vulnerable and at risk of suicide and self-harm, but also to look on the other side at effective evidence-informed interventions. So the strategy was launched in June last year, and it covers seven strategic goals, uh, which um, across the group cover about, uh, 69 different actions. But each of these actions are very clearly linked with evidence, and they are uh, clearly evidence-informed. So a strategic goal is to improve the nation's understanding of and attitudes to suicidal behavior, uh, mental health, and well-being. You can also see here that we take the broad view of not only looking at suicide, but also non-fatal suicidal behavior. And I think that would be an important recommendation for others in other countries to not isolate non-fatal suicidal behavior from uh, suicide because of the very important uh, overlap and the determination of risk by non-fatal suicidal behavior. Uh, local communities' capacity to prevent and respond to suicidal behavior, here we're thinking also of community facilitators such as social workers, uh, police officers, uh, people involved in education. Uh, um, under goal three, we particularly prioritize a number of specific uh, priority groups, but these uh, priority groups clearly arise from um, uh, specific evidence that was gathered during the preparation time. So um, an important priority group is people who engage in self-harm or people who repeatedly engage in self-harm, people who are homeless, um, people bereaved by suicide, and all um, uh, people who, um, uh, who, who uh, show certain vulnerabilities in terms of being impacted by the economic recession, but at the same time also showing mental health vulnerabilities. Goal represents enhancing accessibility, consistency, and care pathways of services for people vulnerable to suicidal behavior. And we particularly highlight um, of different services who are involved when somebody engages in attempted suicide, uh, and also to see what important gaps in the services need to be uh, addressed. And quality services for people vulnerable to suicide. Here we are referring to a putting in place and, and, and broadening so-called evidence-informed interventions. Uh, and in terms of research, we particularly would like to highlight uh, implementation of specific types of cognitive behavior therapy, but also dialectical behavior therapy uh, for certain subgroups of people who self-harm. Six covers the reducing and restricting access to means of suicidal behavior. And in our strategy, there's already a range of actions where particularly we would like to prioritize uh, people engaging in uh, very frequently in certain types of drugs, for example, we have identified through our surveillance systems that benzodiazepines are very frequently used in non-fatal but also fatal suicidal behavior. So that's going to be an area that's going to be targeted. And 
whose goal is to improve on an ongoing basis surveillance, evaluation, and also high quality research, particularly in terms of emerging new risk groups, but also emerging new evidence in terms of intervention and prevention programs. So, I would like to highlight uh, a number of specific examples of actions in the Connect and Connect Life strategy that are clearly evidence based. So, on the first strategic goal, there's a specific action to build the link between alcohol, drug use, and suicidal behavior, and to build that into all communication campaigns. And very strongly supported by robust evidence coming from our national self-harm registry, where um, a couple of years ago we identified a very big difference between uh, men and women who engage in self-harm and whether they have taken alcohol at the time of the act or not. So on the top you can see uh, the patterns, uh, the seasonal patterns for self-harm amongst men and women uh, where alcohol has been involved and then at the bottom you suddenly see important changes when we look at alcohol-related self-harm. So at the chat below you can see that suddenly when we look at alcohol-related self-harm we see a peak for female self-harm patients in the summertime and if alcohol wouldn't be involved we wouldn't see that peak. So for that was at least one important piece of evidence to support uh, that particular uh, action. And this is under strategic goal four, so to enhance accessibility and consistency of care pathways of services for people who are vulnerable to suicidal behavior. And we have formulated a specific action to increase assessment approaches across healthcare services, and also in line with recognized guidelines for people who have self-harmed or who are at risk of suicide. Another piece of evidence, this example, you can clearly see why it's so important to streamline and, and to have uniform procedures for uh, risk assessment, psychosocial risk assessment, but also assessment in relation to repeated self-harm or uh, suicide. So you can consider variation across the group of people who have self-harmed, uh, the on the type of methods they have used. But what is particularly worrying is when you look at people with attempted hanging and attempted drowning, that's still a considerable proportion, so 9 to 14 percent, are leaving the hospital uh, without any recommendation for further care or treatment. And, and the vast majority of these people have also not received uh, assessment. So subsequent suicide is very high amongst this group, and this uh, uh, represented the evidence for the specific action that I uh, mentioned. The type of outcomes of this new national uh, strategy, as in most uh, national strategies, we will be looking at reducing the suicide rate in the whole population and also among specific priority groups. We had discussions about whether we would have a specific type, for example, 5% or 10% in line with what is recommended internationally, but we have to face the reality in Ireland that um, the reporting procedures for, uh, for suicide, and as you can see there's also a relatively large number of undetermined deaths, uh, there is clear indications that, that the reporting procedures can be improved and should be improved in terms of its accuracy. So we felt that if that is happening over the coming years, we may be able to very strictly compare our baseline rates to follow-up rates. So we have to be a bit more cautious there. However, based on our uh, surveillance system, we have very good grounds to also look at changes in the incidence of self-harm rates uh, presenting to general hospitals. And a particularly valuable outcome is to look at change in repeated episodes of self-harm, because if on the one hand, we're trying to improve the service response for people who have self-harmed. We, we expect to see reductions in the self-harm repetition rates of people presenting to a hospital. So, so at the end of this um, uh, session, I would like to highlight again the rigor and very systematic approach that we have taken 
this time round uh, to follow and to pursue implementation and monitoring and also evaluation of the strategy uh, actions. So you can see in this overview we've taken a very structured and systematic approach. And it is fairly unique to say that uh, for the first time we have a specific government committee on social policy and public service reform um, that will be overlooking the implementation and the evaluation of the strategy ongoingly over the coming five years. There's an steering group and also involved in implementation. And what is unique for the strategy that again at this particular level we have on board with us representatives from many relevant government departments. So I think that really opens the whole scope of the it's not only the Department of Health who takes the responsibility, but many other relevant government departments as well. This group is linking in with uh, regional and local stakeholders and will have an ongoing uh, interaction with the National Office for Suicide Prevention in terms of looking at how the implementation is running over time, monitoring and evaluation. Um, well. Particular strategy connecting life to the previous strategy, the 10-year strategy or to other strategies that I've seen in recent times, I would say there's a number of unique and innovative aspects to this uh, strategy. I think at this stage we can really say that this is a truly whole of government engagement in terms of the partnerships around certain actions that are going to be implemented and I think a very unique achievement. This is also recommended by the WHO in the global uh, report. Finally, I think what I would like to say as well is prior to the launch of the strategy, uh, we made sure that uh, the relevant stakeholders involved in the implementation of the actions had some of, of their collaboration and engagement in these actions. So the whole accountability and um, the, the adequacy of the implementation is enhanced by knowing exactly prior to the publication who's going to be involved in implementing which uh, actions. And as I will not stop with research and monitoring uh, um, at the time of the start of the implementation, which is already happening, but there's an ongoing monitoring of, of looking at certain risk groups evolve over time, but also the gathering of new uh, evidence. Primary outcome indicators, but overall we will be looking uh, and at the end of this period in time, uh, also at secondary and intermediate uh, outcomes. Intermediate outcomes refer to, for example, the fact as to uh, has it been possible to improve uh, the service engagement of nurses in emergency departments to fulfill risk assessment procedures or psychosocial assessment procedures. Uh, we will also be looking at the number and the types of professionals being trained in suicide and self-harm awareness uh, training programs during the course of implementing Connecting for Life. We have some colorful uh, pictures. Uh, the first picture on the left side is kind of a symbolic representation of Connecting for Life. So here, many of the stakeholders were connected on the day of the launch to make this call together with our Prime Minister and the Junior Minister for uh, Mental Health. And we see uh, that the Prime Minister and the Junior Minister for Mental Health are joined by Dr. Shekhar Saxena from the WHO, and we were really delighted, well, first of all, that our Prime Minister was engaging with this whole important topic and to, to, uh, to, to launch the, the strategy on that day, but we were also delighted that Dr. Saxena from WHO was able to support and endorse the uh, strategy. So, Fleischmann uh, for this opportunity, and I also thank all the listeners for uh, being with us uh, today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Arensmann. I would like now to introduce our second speaker, and at the end we will hopefully have still a bit time for a few questions and answers. Our second speaker today is Dr. Yeshi Wang Di, who is Deputy Chief Program Officer in the Department of Public Health at the Ministry of Health in the government of Bhutan. He has obtained his 
postgraduation in primary health care management from ASEAN Institute of Health Development at Mahidol University, Bangkok, in Thailand. He's a qualified health professional in the field of prevention, promotion, and curative aspects of primary health care, having obtained mm -hmm. various levels certificates in district health management, clinical management, and tropical community medicines and health from Liverpool, UK. He has been working in the health services since 1984 and has the experience of serving as district health officer in the district health services, clinic officer in referral hospitals and health manager in various health facilities. At present, Dr. Wang Di is working as Deputy Chief Program Officer for the National Suicide Prevention Program in the Department of Public Health at the Ministry of Health in Bhutan. He coordinates and works closely with various stakeholders to ensure the implementation of suicide prevention activities in the country and to ensure the proper implementation, monitoring, and supervision of the National Suicide Prevention Action Plan in Bhutan. Dr. Wee, for your presentation, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Alexander. Uh, can you hear everyone hear me? Yes, yes, it's fine. Thank you. Okay, Lavender once again, and uh, thank you for inviting me in this uh, uh, lesson for those who are uh, for this meeting today. So, to make a presentation on the national suicide prevention in Bhutan and the action plan is in action since 2015, and this document has been approved by the by the government of today. Okay. Uh, the of the background information and uh, with a few facts of the suicide in Bhutan. And basically, I will be talking more on the suicide prevention in Bhutan, a plan, and the implementing mechanisms, also of the district's uh, implementing agencies and the local uh, government in the district. And at the end, towards the end, if there be uh, if there be time for me, me? there's a problem with the slides. Um, for this, people mm -hmm. cannot see the slides. Could you please uh, share the slides to share view the slides? Uh, this because um, uh, on the net. Uh, you see it on your screen? Yeah. Okay, one moment, please. Is Dr. Hanna talking to you currently? Yeah. I think he's trying on how to share the slides. Hear him? Can you hear him? I know I can hear him. I can. Hello. Hello? Hello? I cannot hear you. Hello? Yes, um, Dr. Wang Di, can you hear me? I, can, uh, I cannot hear you. No. Put your cursor on the top. Uh, you have a tab that is called share. See share. Mm. Screen. My screen. My. Oh, yeah, and you click yes, yes. 
now I see yes yes I see your first slide now yes and now yes. you put, yes, now you are in the slide presentation and everyone can see your slides now please proceed with your presentation yes thank you so much thank, thank you so you. much thank, thank you Dr you. Alexander for inviting me in this forum and it's really a privilege for me again to make a presentation on the National Suicide Prevention in Bhutan a three-year action plan which is in operational by July 2015 and this has been approved by the ruling government of today. Uh, beginning with the little background information and facts of the suicide in Bhutan and We'll be talking a little bit more on the suicide prevention in Bhutan, our three-year action plan, and what are the implementing mechanisms, and the roles and the responsibilities of the district and the land and other implementations. And of the, the the time, the, if there be any time for me, so I will be a little bit touch upon on the need to establish a system to improve data information, establishment of national suicide registry in the country. The role of concern over the increasing number of suicide cases and serious public health issues that cause extreme pain and suffering for the people who are behind. And in the, 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 the of the suicide cases, it uh, causes of the death. That is 2009 to 13. They represented about 361 suicide death cases and the average of uh, 73 suicide cases in a year, which comes to six suicide deaths in a month. A country like Bhutan, where we have a small population. Uh, uh, it has become a very serious issue and the government has taken it in the right uh, time. So, productive age groups, that is 87% of the date, occur in a group of 42, 15%. With the current cases, the government has directed to carry out the detailed study on the suicide cases in Bhutan. These are some of the key milestones. Men were formed with the uh, institutional analysis on the suicide cases were kept, and uh, analysis report we presented to the cabinet. After, uh, the cabinet uh, has, has to conduct a nationwide the suicide survey, and which is on 2014. And report following this report, they also directed the Minister of Health to. Develop uh, a next plan for the prevention of suicide in Bhutan. And within three months' time, this was developed and presented to the cabinet again. In May 2015, the cabinet endorsed this action plan for immediate implementation. A study that we have conducted, the most is about 88% have occurred in the rural areas. Not in the urban, and also with 66% and those with less education. And suicide deaths occurred among the uneducated people, while 58% of the suicide deaths in the low income, that is under about 3,000 per month. Extension problems, dom domestic violence, and emotional abuse are the significant risk factors for suicide in Bhutan, according to the issue we conducted in 2014. Completed suicide and 90% of attempted suicides came where youth and the young adults. So, the, 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 this case, the adult groups and the young adults, and a person of those who com complete suicide and 23% of the people who attempted suicide had shown some signs of killing themselves in the verbal or written expression. 
19 people who completed suicide then suicide earlier and of the victims who had committed suicide were reported to have consumed drugs or alcohol and more of related to the mental health illness if you look at uh, uh, date range from 2009 to 13 in so there is, uh, I mean, from in between 2009 to 10, it was declined. But however, from 2010, it is uh, increasing. And still, uh, according to the 2014 and 15, so that 10 is still uh, increasing. If you suicide, according to the report, the survey report, the related issues stop causes and it is the followed by deletion uh, relationship issues the disease related issues and so it's more of a relationship issues with 24 figures now in mind and then the and the, uh, the fact figures of the uh, Bhutan that we have been revealed from the 2014 uh, study so we have developed the national suicide prevention in Bhutan, and this is a time plan because because the 11 five-year plan that is related to 2018, and also we point with the the present government. The goal of this plan is basically to promote, coordinate, and support a appropriate sectoral action plans and programs for the prevention of suicide at the national level at the level at the, the community level and the, and the main goal is to prevent a premature death across life span due to suicide among the Buddhist population the key more of a multi stakeholders approach it is uh, stakeholders and and this action plan is more of an action oriented and aspirational document because the action plan oriented us when what are the activities to be completed to be where to be implemented when and how and by whom and this time and this action plan is comprehensive at the so and the indicated actions Of universal, selective, and the indicated state to address the spectrum of suicide risks. If universal, it the entire population and level of selective, so it it tied to the increased risk for the suicidal behaviors, and at level of indicated, it is high risk for the suicidal behaviors. Prevention at the universal level is more of awareness programs and responsible for the media, media the drugs, alcohol, and the parenting programs. And at, it is a question for the individuals who drug users, gatekeeping trainings, crisis, crisis help plan, and indicated level is the management of the suicide behavior. Post for those thieves or the people who are left behind with the suicide. If you look at the plan during the uh, during the, the development of the action plan, so considered how effectiveness it would be really to have a desired outcome and how costly it would be the cost of the interventions available. And the implementable and the public outcome will be there at the end of the action plan. Will it be a reduction in the suicide deaths and better outcomes? Whether culturally acceptability will be there or not, will the community and society accept the and this dimension considered during the initial moment of this action plan? How the suicide prevention and Bhutan plan? So this is a the, this is the suicide prevention.
initiation function will be like. So since initiative, so get at the top and cabinet. So the Ministry of Health is just because that suicide prevention steering committee is in the Ministry of Health. So under steering uh, in the Ministry of Health, there is no suicide prevention program. And I am uh, assigned to uh, I mean look after this program and suicide prevention program. Um, uh, also act as a secretary to the National Steering Committee and coordinating body, body with the uh, rest of the implementing agencies and, and responsibilities is uh, uh, will have its uh, own area as a stakeholder, as a partner in implementation, in implementation plan. Some of the guiding principles of the action plan is suicide will be broad and coordinated system working with a wide range of partners, organs in the sector, including people who have been affected by the suicide. Eight factors related to the suicidal behaviors, including support, management, economic factors, and the personal risks at the risk length comprehensive targeting population systems and forcing on the individual level risk for the suicide. The is basically at number one is to, suicide, to establish a suicide prevention steering committee and uh, this has been established and launched in the Ministry of Health. There is a national suicide prevention program which established under the Ministry of Health and Suicide Prevention Unit, Crime and Operation Divisions, the Royal Bhutan Police Quarter, Thimphu, because uh, uh, actively involved in the investigations of both the attempted suicides and completed suicides. And there are the responsibilities of the government and the district authorities. Implementation of the suicide prevention work plan should occur in the urban cities. The district and the health offices have the responsibilities to ensure the appropriate implementation of the suicide prevention work plan. The suicide prevention activities are embedded with the government's management system, which should at the to measure performance indicators. The important thing is that uh, the district has to establish is to establish the Zongda suicide prevention team to and response team to ensure the effective response to rescue the systems and deliver self harm incidents occurring in communities and office. Urban Health Office will be the secretariat and the coordinating body for implementing the action plan and action of Zonga's top one. Zonga governor in the district. Advise the district on the action plan and ensure that the implementation review is created during the quarterly review of the overall district plan and is yearly planning and stakeholders for the suicide prevention at the district level. This action plan is the, the six broad objectives uh, uh, to be met. And the objective is to improve leadership, sectoral engagement, and the suicide prevention in the communities. And the second ten governance and the institutional arrangement to effectively implement comprehensive and suicide prevention plans. Improve access to prevention services and support for individuals in the psychosocial crisis and those most at risk for suicide. Of health services and gatekeepers to provide prevention services and community resilience and the support for the suicide prevention in the communities in 
schools and and is to improve data evidence and information for suicide prevention planning and uh, and uh, <coughs> we have a series of uh, the activities that has been listed implementing agencies are, have been uh, marked under which is who will have to uh, carry out the activities and, uh, and with the time uh, when they have to think and, and I will be go I will be going through all the details of the uh, activities so that under each uh, broad uh, of there are series of activities uh, that is with the timelines and and responsible implementing agencies so that's for my side thank you very much for listening to this uh, presentation thank you excellent i am now handing over to my colleague uh, the, uh, because I think he has been monitoring incoming questions and may have questions for our presenters. Thank you. Doctor, please. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandra. I hope you can hear me now. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we have the, we have the, first, uh, the first question to, uh, uh, to Dr. Arendtman about, uh, about what is your recommendation? to governments for creating suicide plans. Uh, Sami? Yes, yes, you are clear. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. Uh, yeah, so recommendations in terms of uh, evaluation for, for government uh, representatives. That's right. Um, I would strongly recommend that uh, in line with the WHO Global Report, uh, government representatives or policy makers uh, would make sure that there are real uh, surveillance mechanisms or systems uh, available in the country. Uh, and first and foremost, to look at the accurate suicide uh, statistics, um, but also to 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 try to start looking at non-fatal suicidal behavior. And in this regard, it is. Finally, <clears throat> to mention uh, an upcoming manual, um, maybe Dr. Fleischmann can say something about the exact timing of the publication, but we have been working with WHO on producing um, a manual uh, the surveillance systems on non-fatal uh, suicidal behavior, so attempted suicide or self -harm. And um, because, particularly in small countries, it may sometimes be to determine are, is there a stabilization in trends, is it upping, or, or do we see a downward trend now? Um, we know uh, from international research that uh, non-fatal self-harm amongst men um, can be considered a proxy for trends in fatal suicidal behavior because of the closer collaboration uh, co co uh, correlation between those. So I think it would be important to encourage governments to not only look at actions, but also to look at surveillance. A last point about uh, uh, in terms of other outcomes, um, um, engagement process with government representatives here in Ireland. Uh, the more uh, government representatives saw the rest of certain actions, the more they wanted to know about is this going to work, how is this going to unfold. So there was a greater understanding of monitoring and evaluation. So also in terms of the quality of the implementation. So for example, to start looking at, okay, we want to increase the capacity of nurses in the emergency department, then in two years time, we really want to know that every uh, significant hospital in the country has at least one or two uh, specialized nurses, well-trained up to work with people who have self-harmed. So they started to become more interested in also wanting to know about uh, would we be able to, to achieve those intermediate outcomes as well, which is at the same time will be a reflection of the quality of your implementation. Um, but <coughs> important 
advice is to start engaging with your government representatives um, rather sooner than later. Thank you very much. I have a question for I have the next question to to my, my colleague, Dr. Alexandra Fleischmann, uh, about the approaches implemented by WHO to move the progress toward implementation, particularly of Target 3.2 of the Mental Health Action Action Plan. How WHO is monitoring the progress towards this target until 2020? Uh, there are uh, various things in place. So one, of course, is the statistics. Uh, we have the WHO mortality database to which uh, WHO member states officially report their suicide mortality data. So they report all causes of death, but suicide, of course, is among uh, the CD uh, causes of death. So from there, we already get some information information. In addition, the WHO Central Statistics Unit produces um, periodically the official WHO global health estimates. And the latest were for the year 2012, which were published in the WHO 2014 Suicide Prevention Report. And uh, the next update of these global health estimates, including for, for suicide mortality, we released uh, later this year for year 2015. So through that, we have already a possibility uh, to monitor uh, changes in <coughs> rates. In addition, our Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse has a, a tool uh, to monitor progress, is, which is a global survey, um, uh, which is called the, the Atlas Survey, which is sent to all member states uh, through ministries of health, and they officially nominate focal points to respond to this, sur this survey. So this we will uh, have another round of data collection, where we will have questions about suicide prevention actions that are taken by countries uh, included, and that will be another way of monitoring progress. Thank you. Dr. Fleischmann, my next question for Dr. Wang Di. The question is, uh, uh, is Dr. Sol Duran, who is a psychiatrist based in Mexico. Are you online? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Thank, you. thank you. The question is asking asking about how are you dealing in Bhutan uh, with the stick of the suicide attempts, particularly the professionals. So how are suicide attempts among among health professionals, especially the non psychiatrist stuff? Uh, thank you very much for the thank question. You. One the activities that has been incorporated in our uh, uh, the suicide action plan and, uh, and the academicians like uh, the universities and institute institutions are responsible in developing our human resources on the technical counselors and the counselors uh, are uh, are the people who will be closely working with the the people who have attempted suicide and not only with the people who have attempted suicide also for the and the, the family members who are uh, left behind because of the suicide and like you have mentioned so there is no not much uh, we have done on the the coming with the stigmatization for those who have attempted suicide but definitely in line with the action plan. And now <coughs> we already started uh, uh, putting place in the district. And really like uh, uh, suicides and even the suicides are occurring in the uh, Ministry of Education, that is schools. And so we make, I mean, started uh, placing a, a trained counselors schools and why they can uh, work out on the the, risk of the stigmatizations and these counselors basically working closely with those 
who have suicide and with those families who are who are the uh, the suicide. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gandhi. Uh, I ha I have two questions to to Dr. Arendsman. Uh, is is uh, is again a question from uh, uh, from Dr. Sol Durant. Uh, it is asking about where is the place you would recommend for to, of people with suicide risk at a hospital, general hospital. And one is about what can be done at taker level or caregiver level and level to reduce suicide attempts. Mm -hmm. Two questions. And the question is by by Dr. Richa Charma, uh, uh, who is a, a mental health researcher based in India. Thank you, Dr. Anna. Can you please repeat briefly the second question? The is about what can be done at caregiver level to suicide attempts. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. So, so in terms of the main place for um, working or assessing people with uh, suicide, it's a very good uh, question, first of all, because um, in recent times in Ireland, we have seen that many people who have not yet engaged in a suicide attempt or an act of self-harm, but who have, who are struggling with suicidal ideation, are also very often being sent to the emergency department, a full emergency department, uh, where they have to wait very long, where they may not feel being approached uh, very in a very sensitive way. Um, so it's 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 very clear that we have to be careful as to where we refer to people for certain assessments. Now, one option uh, or one alternative setting that has been put in place in Ireland in recent times is um, providing additional nurses, well-trained nurses, who work very closely with general pr practitioners, so in, in the more primary care setting. Where, um, before, when these well-trained nurses weren't there, the GPs were obliged, or sometimes they know anything else than sending people at suicide risk to a psychiatric ward or to an emergency department. They now have this opportunity in some areas in the country, it's, it's, it's a growing implementation, uh, to consult with uh, a specially trained nurse who can start fairly immediately engaging with this uh, client, with, with, with this person in terms of assessing suicide uh, risk. So again, we're looking at opportunities that come closer to community-based uh, care or primary care than um, having to resort all the time to the psychiatric department or the emergency uh, department. Um, one important point also to make again, and this links in a little bit with the previous uh, question, um, in giving people the appropriate attention and to be sensitive in your approach which means that it's very important for all staff at the emergency department. And because of this, we have put in place evidence-based training, not only for nurses, for doctors, for psychiatrists, but for all people working in the emergency department. And it's a so-called awareness training to um, increase people's knowledge and change people's eyes in terms of suicide and self-harm, and to be able to be open and empathic when people come through the door of the emergency uh, department. Because a lot of people who leave without a recommendation, it's not only because we are facing busy psychiatrists, it's also because people feel not welcomed, they feel not well supported, even at the door of an emergency department or a psychiatric uh, hospital. So that's my answer to the first question. Then of uh, caregivers and um, community support, again, it's a very important question because it's only in recent years that we know that family members who are bereaved by suit, but also family members who deal with members who are repeatedly engaging in self-harm, they feel very um, 
often not well supported. They also feel sometimes uh, stigmatized. So um, we, we have in our five year also uh, a proposal, first of all, to link members in a more intensive and a more direct way um, in the assessment, the assessment procedure, but also after the assessment procedure following self-harm or attempted suicide when uh, there are the proposals for next step of care to still keep engaging with family members so that family members are more aware as to what are the options and the opportunities for my son, my daughter, or my uh, partner. The important need that is that needs to be addressed for family members, uh, particularly when uh, they're dealing with their son or daughter who has just survived a highly lethal act of self-harm, is uh, to deal with their concerns and their anxiety, because very often they are very concerned that uh, soon there may be a next attempt or something may genuinely take his or her life. Um, so it's not only the engagement of family members in the process of assessment and treatment referral, but also uh, additional support for family members who sometimes may even be suffering from anxiety or uh, post-traumatic stress following very severe acts of uh, non-fatal self-harm. Thank you very much, Dr. Ansman, for this very informative informative response to the questions. And um, another another question to 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 my colleague, Dr. Fleischman, is is about how how sure that accurate data are being reported by countries, including is considered a criminal offense. So it's, I think it's about reliability of, of data as well. Yeah, uh, and I would say ensure <laughs> we can uh, encourage um, have uh, better quality and availability of data. However, um, as uh, suicide is a sensitive and the issue in some countries is even realized. Um, of course, we uh, we have to be aware that there will be some underreporting due to the stigma associated with it. Uh, uh, and so, of course, we have to make attempts and uh, in suicide prevention to also fight at the stigma uh, that is associated with suicide and, and mental health issues more generally. Yeah, that's all I can say. Any final comments you want to you want to give before before I thank you. Can I say something? Um, yes, 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 please, Dr. Hansman, go ahead. Dr. Fenn was speaking, and also when I heard a very interesting presentation from um, my colleague in Boulogne, again, couldn't escape me that we are uh, fortunately, I think, moving in a more positive um, and I think a more encouraging time of suicide uh, prevention because since the publication of the global uh, report on suicide prevention by the WHO, we have re in the International Association for Suicide Prevention, we received an increasing number of requests from different countries, countries from all over the world, uh, for further information, for templates or examples in building a national suicide prevention program. And what we're going to hear and, and read in these messages is that when people detect that in a certain geographic area, a certain region, or a certain country has taken up the courage uh, to speak to their governments and to start implementing a national suicide prevention program, it seems that the sense of not wanting to be left behind. And obviously that, that's not the only factor, but it's an important factor when people are struggling with observations of sudden increases of suicide in certain or areas, but that if they see that their neighbor, their own country, has been able to implement or to even start at one of the first steps of uh, suicide prevention, as Dr. Fleischmann uh, outlined, um, they have to be. They have, they have to join their colleagues. They have to join their 
neighbours. So I think that's something I haven't seen before of last 30 I'm, I'm really optimistic that in this concerted effort, um, the WHO report uh, may have also have had a kind of an accelerating uh, effect on stimulating suicide prevention programs uh, globally. And this is a very, very good to hear, really. Uh, Angie, any, any final comments or key messages from your side, please? Uh, thank you very much for the, the opportunities given to me again. And uh, I don't have much to say on this one. Basically, it's just to thank uh, uh, for this opportunity to join this group uh, on online meeting. And it was really a pleasure for me to hear for a wonderful presentation in the island and it was really educative and then good and answers that has been uh, conducted here so it is very, it is really uh, uh, very educative and uh, uh, in particularly it is, I have thought of uh, not, uh, not from this meeting thank you so much I will be looking forward to have a similar meeting here after thank you so much thank you Thank you very much, Dr. Bangdi, and thank you very much, Dr. Anman, our two distinguished speakers, and thanks to my colleague, Dr. Fleischmann, and thanks for our HIN members who participated on, on the webinar webinar today. Uh, as as always, a, a recorded version of this uh, of this webinar will be available on MHIN, and and stay tuned for MHIN website to uh, to know about the the coming uh, the coming Ask the Policy Expert webinar. Thank you.